Hello and welcome to another episode of Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Mr. Elijah Gilmore, known to some as Elijah G. He's also connected with a, an entity called Tribe of Eli, and we're going to talk about that. But I'm going to go on a limb and say that I am sitting in the presence of a rock star. I know that you uh, have toured you. nationally with some very impressive musicians, namely Gladys Knight and others, but I want to give you an opportunity to tell us about that. But I usually like to start just by giving folks a sense of, you know, your upbringing. So where did you come up? Okay. I grew up in the Woodland, Buckeye area, not too far from Shaker Square. Okay. So a family of five. Mm -hmm. I was the eldest. I have a brother and a sister. We're all a year apart. And my mother and father is Dr. Thomas Gilmore and Dr. Dianthea Gilmore. Okay. So that, that gives you quite a pedigree. And what I know about you is that you are basically a master percussionist. So you don't just play drums uh, or hand, you play hand drums, you play the drum set, drum kit, and all that. Uh, what sparked your interest in percussion? That's a great question. Just as a child, the drums have naturally caught my attention out of all the instruments. When I listen to music, the beat catches my heart the most. And I like all instruments, but the drums always had a special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. Was there someone that inspired you to pick up drums and someone <clears throat> that perhaps you followed as a way of connecting with that music? Yes. I grew up in church, and the drummer, his name was J.R., he would always allow me to come up and tap on the drum set after church and I would rip the handles of the fans and beat on the seats and try to mimic him. That was my first introduction to drums. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, Elijah, that things that happen to us when we're small have an impact or an imprint, some describe it as, that keeps us coming or keeps us connected to whatever that thing was. So mm -hmm. I'd have to imagine over a long period of time, your immersion in the drums led you to be as proficient as you are today. Absolutely. Also, my parents played a role in who I am today, too. They weren't professional musicians, but they kept music in the home. You know, everything from classical music to gospel music to jazz. My mother even, even told me when I was in her stomach that she would play music and she could feel me move around. So if we want to get deep with it, you know, but I have to give them credit too. They brought me my first drum set. They saw that I was interested in music and I'm very thankful for the support they've shown me over the years and love them very much. And I'm just so grateful to have those type of parents because some people grow up not having the support or not even knowing their parents at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd also have to imagine that uh, your connection to drums was something that kept you out of, of trouble as a youngster. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Many of the kids around my neighborhood, they would tell me that they could hear me all the way up the street. And while everybody was outside playing, I would be in the basement or the attic practicing. And even some of the thugs or some of the kids who were not as fortunate to have the parents that I had, they could tell, and they would tell me, hey, Elijah, you got something there. You know, keep, keep going. And to this day, if I go back to the neighborhoods, they kind of get teary-eyed and say, well, he told you. You know, 
but everybody didn't ha wasn't as as fortunate. Yeah. So I, I I'm very grateful for the gift of music. I could imagine that it could have went a different way. I could be dead. I could be locked up in jail. Just there's so many paths that I could have took in that may not allow me to experience the life that I've experienced. Mm -hmm. So uh, from what I know about you, you are definitely a student of music. Could you talk about your approach, your study, and where it has taken you in terms of your understanding that allows you to benefit other folks with your, your sure. knowledge? And taken, <laughs> correct. Can you ask me that question? One more time. I just want to get a sense of how you studied so that you know what you know, because you're into music therapy. Mm -hmm. You're also mm -hmm. a master drummer. So mm -hmm. there had to be some education involved unless it was all self-taught. But I, something tells me it was more than that. In the beginning, it was I learned music primarily by ear. Eventually, I auditioned. to become a student at the Cleveland School of the Arts. And from there, I wound up getting a scholarship to study jazz at Tri-C. And from there, I studied at the Cleveland Settlement of Music. And then from there, I, I studied at Wilberforce University. So I do have some formal or, um, I do have education. And, 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 and I was exposed to music theory I would say that my ears still are my strongest asset because in a lot of environment, musical environments that I'm in, they don't present the drummer with sheet music, even if they're reading sheet music. So I'm, I'm grateful for the ears that I've developed over the years. Now when I'm doing a play, for example, then that's when it's like, okay, what does this chart say? say but uh a lot of times it's just like elijah feel your way right yeah 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 you know it's, it's interesting because uh i've witnessed some performances of the cleveland jazz orchestra mm -hmm. and and i've seen a drummer affixed to a sheet of paper or or however yeah. they do it you know reading the music and playing the drums at the same time you know it's kind of unusual to see that but when you're participating in an orchestral situation you have to know what everybody's doing and you have to know what your part is so then it becomes important to read music but absolutely the, in theater is much like that yeah but on the other hand you know you have this gift it's something that's instinctive and you have an ear that enables you to play what's appropriate at the time that you're playing so um i personally to me it's more important to have it here than to have it here I would agree with you. I guess it depends in, like you said, the situation. Because right. if you're in a more arranged orchestral situation, then the eyes are going to mean more. Mm -hmm. I, I say if you can be balanced with it and have both worlds, that's a good thing. I am glad that I have more ear than I. Yes. But I'm glad that I'm also balanced and I can go do that theater gig. Yes. Yeah. So at some point, uh, as your star continued to rise, you ended up on stages with some very impressive musicians. So talk about what it was like for you to make the transition of being uh, a local artist into being an, an artist that has a national or international uh, pedigree. Can you expound more on that question? Well, I'm just trying to find out what it was like for you to go from playing at the reason why or, you know, uh, the Civic Theater in Cleveland Heights to playing on a stage with Gladys Knight. Are you asking me how I transitioned to yes. that, or are you asking me the different experiences? Well, I want to know about the, the, the transition, but then I'd like to know about some of those experiences. Okay. So, in the music industry, your brand is built by you putting yourself out here. And I was very fortunate to be around the right people coming into the game. I worked with Lamar Gaines Sr. and Drain Ivey coming into the game. 
You remember the boarding house? Mm -hmm. You know, and that really opened some doors and helped to get my brand out here on the local side. And the more my brand grew, then when national work came through the area, my name would be mentioned. For instance, I toured with Joe McBride for a good decade, was blessed to work with him, and that came from my name being circulated in the music industry in Cleveland. So when he said, hey, we need a drummer to go on the road with Joe McBride, my name was in those conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that led to opening other doors. And it's, it's, it's really a, about building good relationships and protecting your brand and your reputation. You know, there's so much to your brand outside of the music, being professional, having a great attitude, you know, keeping in touch with people, you know, having equipment and transportation and the things that may seem simple, those small things make a huge difference in the callback mm -hmm. and the referral. Yeah. So yeah. you get connections and then yeah. somebody connects you with someone yeah. else. And, yeah. you know, it, it's interesting when you look at certain musicians and you look at all the different people that they played with. Some musicians may be with someone for a career. Some of them may go from this person to that person to that person. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of convenience. Sometimes it's because somebody got a project that they couldn't say no to and they wanted to participate with that. But, you know, one of the things that impresses me about Cleveland is the depth of talent that we have here. Mm -hmm. And there are so many Clevelanders who have had similar experiences to you in that they've been on stages with people like Babyface and Beyonce mm -hmm. and, you know, all kinds of folks. Uh, I'm thinking of Monica Miss Drummer. Yes. You know, I yes. see her videos on Facebook all the time, different stages. One of my good diff friends. Different artists. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we have a depth of talent. Some are motivated to leave, some just are, I guess, basically satisfied to be in Cleveland. And it's to our betterment that they are here yeah. because we get the benefit of, of what they do. Uh, one of the things that you have done is you have created something called Tribe of Eli. Talk yes, to us about what that is and what it's about. Okay, so a little bit of the background behind the name Tribe of Eli. We used to do a open mic. We did it for about a good three years strong called IM216, featuring some of the best singers, poets, and musicians around the area. And we were the house band. I was the leader of the house band. They said, what are we going to call the house band? And they came up with Tribe of Eli. That's where that name came from. So I have interests outside of music. And a lot of times I think about how can we move our world forward, our, move our human family forward to achieve world peace so that we don't self-destruct. Because everybody has bombs. We all can push our bombs, and that's it. And I'm just sitting, talking to a few friends, and we thought about it. How could we get closer to world peace? And it sounds like something that's a dream that could never happen. But we know that many ideas in its inception seem radical or you can't achieve that. So I believe whatever we think we can achieve and whatever we think we can't, either way we're right. So if I'm going to go with we can achieve anything, then certainly we can achieve this. We just got, we have to think. Every, everything is a, a problem waiting to be solved. So after thinking long enough about it, I said, you know what? What are our issues? Our issues are us relating with each other. Why aren't they teaching us emotional intelligence from elementary to college like they teach us math and science? I thought about it long enough, said, ah, I see. If we teach emotional intelligence in school, now I have to be self-aware. 
Now I have to figure out why am I triggered by you being a different color or being a different religion or you being a woman, getting your bag. Why, why does that trigger me? You know, now I have to try to understand that someone else who may have a different perspective or life than me and be able to respect them. These are things that are going to come with re emotional intelligence. Problem solving skills. Maybe I don't want to solve the problem. So I can't teach emotional intelligence because that would get rid of sexism. That would eliminate racism. I said, OK, maybe we can pass a law, which we're still working on, called the Heaven on Earth Act, which makes it mandatory that emotional intelligence is taught in school, from elementary to college, like math and science. And we said, you know, that might take a little while to pass that. So why don't, what can we do within our power to affect change now? And that's when we started the Tribe of Eli mentoring program. And we noticed that not only were we having a good impact with the children, the parents wanted to learn too. Then my manager was like, okay, Elijah, this is gonna have to be a movement. You're gonna have to start speaking out. You gotta finish a book to get the information out here. And so far it's been pretty successful. We've taken it to the House of Blues, Palace Theater, uh, New Bridge of Arts and Technology. It's, it's, it's been a pretty successful program and we've been fine tuning and polishing things as we go. But I can say I'm, I'm grateful of the impact it's had so far on our community. And we want to push this thing on a worldwide level because this is not just a Cleveland issue. Even though Cleveland is in the top five cities for racism and sexism, so it's definitely great for Cleveland. And Cleveland's a great city. Let's, 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 let's clarify that I love my city, but there are some things we can work on. And I think this program is great for our, our city, but I think it's just good in general for our world to have the tools so that we can get steps closer to achieving what seems like a dream. And that's that we can operate as one human family. Mm. Could you describe uh, what a session might look like or the, the, the program itself? How do you go about enhancing emotional intelligence or addressing uh, emotional intelligence with, with what you bring with uh, Tribe of Eli? That's a great question. So we have different games and exercises, like we may do, for instance, charades. And the person needs to guess what emotion that person is feeling, you know, and what, what are some options that you could, how could you respond to this particular situation? Then we also incorporate, which makes our program unique, drum therapy. And we found this to be very good in the learning environment, not just to teach and for people to learn quicker, but to also be able to retain the information. Our program not only teaches the emotional intelligence, we teach health and wellness, which is like diet and meditation. We teach environmental protection, and we also teach cultural diversity. Okay, that, that's quite a, a spectrum there yeah, 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 of yeah. different issues, but there's connection. I was gonna say, it all relates. Mm -hmm. In us taking care of our planet, that's self-love. We're taking care of ourselves. You know, in us, having the right diet and knowing how to use tools like meditation, we can be in the best mental space and we can perform and be more productive. Mm -hmm. So with that said, talk to me about the power of music on the individual. Mm. What, what does it do to the brain? How does it benefit, benefit people to be connected with music? So that's also another good question, Vince. A lot of people may not know this, but music is one of the few things that we know of, at least right now, that actually stimulates the entire brain. Chess doesn't do this. Math doesn't do this. Learning another language doesn't do this. Music is the only thing we know that if you were to listen to some music right now, your entire brain would be stimulated. And if you were to start to 
stump your foot, or to start to dance or sing along, your brain would light up even more. And we're still in the early stages of learning about music in the brain. Right now we're using music and neurology to understand the brain better. But music is great for so many reasons. It's great for therapy. Uh, many times if I'm down and I need to be lifted up, I put on music with an upbeat or up tempo. If I'm having anxiety, I'll play music that's more relaxing. Um, music is great as a way to channel our frustrations. I would encourage people to pick up an instrument because again, it's, it's therapeutic. So instead of you punching a hole in the wall, you can get on your guitar, your, your, your drums, and it's a way to deal with your emotions. Music helps us bring, music brings us together. Uh, we can go to a Michael Jackson concert and everybody from different walks of life can get along with each other for an hour and a half to two hours. So there's the power from that angle. Of course, music is a great way to express ourselves. I mean, honestly, you know, I, yeah. I, I'm just, I just really love music, so I can do this all day. But right, I, right. I just think uh, music is a beautiful thing that I've been blessed with the opportunity to do every day. But again, if you would talk to maybe a carpenter, they would tell you through their eyes how everything's connected to the carpentry. There you go. And, yeah. You know. But you know, I, I'm just remembering. I heard Leonard Bernstein at, at Cleveland State University way back in the '80s, and he was just talking about how there are three ways that you can access heaven. Mm -hmm. And he said sex was one. <laughs> he said religion was, was that another tantra, one. Tantra sex? <laughs> Possibly. Okay, okay. Uh, but then the third thing that he said was music. We have just a couple of moments left, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, who are your top five favorite drummers? Mm. Got to throw Tony Williams in there. Um, Vinnie Cayuta. Okay. Herbie's drummer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Dennis Chambers. Let me throw a couple of percussionists in there. Okay. Tito Puente. Okay. Alex Acuna. All right, all right. Okay, so we didn't hear Roy Haynes. Listen, I only have five <laughs> spots. I mean, I, I want to throw Pancho Sanchez. I mean, we, we have five spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I read your, your bio online, and, and it mentioned that you were, uh, I think it, the term was classical jazz artist. Uh, and I, I know that you uh, have a great desire to, to stay true to who you are, but I also know that you are very fond of Afrobeats and you do yes. events that are dedicated to that. Um, quickly, tell folks how they can hear you play Afrobeats. Okay, you can follow me on iHeartRadio as Elijah Gilmore. You can follow me on Pandora Radio, Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, just any major platform, you, you can follow me under Elijah Gilmore. I do have a new album coming out called Manifestation, which is an Afrobeat jazz album. We don't have an exact date yet, but that will be released this year in 2024. Okay. Yes. Well, we're actually going to take a listen to you as a musician. Uh, we're going to roll some footage as the credits usher okay. our program to an end today. But I want to sincerely thank you for stopping by Community Focus Television for this, this sit down thank with Vince me. on Open Door. And uh, much success to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to, at some point, playing music with Elijah Gilmore. Hey. Who knows? It hey, might even happen in here. Hey, yeah. That <laughs> Thanks would be for good. joining me. Thank you for having me. All right. And to those of you who have been viewing us, as always, know yourself, love yourself, be yourself, make today your absolute best day. Peace.
looking in my mirror took me by surprise I can't help but see I'll keep holding on